Welcome to day four of Learn jQuery in 30 days. And this is where we actually get to take some of the methods we've learned and begin building actual stuff, which is obviously what you want to do. So today we're going to be focusing on events, how we can respond to specific events that occur. For example, when an element is clicked on, when you hover over it, when you double click, these things are called events. So to demonstrate how these work, let's build a little style sheet switcher. Essentially, you click on a button and it will load maybe the nighttime style sheet. And when you click on another button, it will load the daytime. And this will be a perfect way to detect and listen for when the user clicks on a button and then respond accordingly. I will open up Sublime Text, and here we have a simple page, pretty much a boilerplate. We have our HTML, we're pulling in jQuery from Google CDN, and we're all set to go. So the first step is we need to mock a website. I'll simply create an H1 that says my website, and I think that's enough. I think that's a fantastic website. So now I want to add two buttons that will allow the user to specify whether they want the nighttime style sheet or the daytime. Or you could imagine maybe you have a style sheet for maybe younger people who can read smaller text and a different one where the font size will be much larger. Or maybe the layout will be different for people who have a little trouble seeing the page. Nonetheless, we'll stick with the day and night. That's fairly common. So to listen for these events, we can either use anchor tags and listen for when that's clicked. But we're going to use a button in this case because if you think about it, if JavaScript is not enabled, usually you use the anchor tag to link the person manually to wherever it is you're trying to go. In this case, there really isn't anywhere we would take them if JavaScript was disabled. They simply wouldn't have that ability to adjust the style sheet. So in that case, I think a button will do just fine. We'll call this first one the daytime button, and we'll call the next one the nighttime button. So the next step is we need to have these two style sheets. So we'll create them in the root of our project, day.css, and then I will create one more called night.css. Now, to simulate the difference between day and night, we're not going to use any server-side or detect what time of day it is. That's not necessary for learning about events. But for day, we'll set the background to a sunny yellow, and then we'll set the nighttime. We'll set a background of black, and I'll make sure the color is white, just so you can have some detection that this represents night and this represents day. Now, by default, when the user loads the page, we're going to give them the daytime style sheet. So I'll pull that in, day.css, and let's view this in the browser. And there we go. That's pretty much what we would expect, an amazing website. So now we're going to listen for when the user clicks on one of these buttons, and when they do, we're going to load the applicable style sheet. Let's go back and get started. I'm gonna begin by using what we call a self-invoking anonymous function. And I don't want this to scare you. This isn't specific to jQuery. It's simply a JavaScript best practice. And here's the idea. If we're creating all of these variables, some var, my var, these are what we call global variables, which means they are available to the window object window.myvar. And this is considered a bad practice because you're muddying it up. You don't need to have all of these global variables. It's better to make those local variables so that they're not available to the global object. And this is generally what we do for simple projects is you create a function. So let's do this by hand, function. And then we want to execute that function immediately because otherwise it wouldn't run until you called it. So I will wrap this function within parentheses and then we're going to call it in the same way that you would call a normal func using an opening and closing parentheses. So I'll simply take that and pull it over. And now we have a function that immediately when the page loads will execute. And now when I create a variable, it is local and it's not available to the window object. So get in the habit of doing that. Now the first step is we want to listen for when one of these buttons is clicked. And I'll show you a few different ways to do it. First, we'll take a look at the convenience version, and that's by using the click method. So first, we need to target the buttons. So I'm going to say, hey, jQuery, go into the DOM and fetch me all of the button elements. Note that that will not only refer to these, but if there are other ones on your page as well, it will return those too. So that's something you might want to think about. Do they need to be within a container? Do they need to have a class so that you can target them? This will all depend on your specific project. But for now, I want to keep it simple. So jQuery, go get the buttons out of the DOM, and I want you to listen for when each is clicked on. So we're going to use the click method. And then here, we need to pass a function. And this means, what are we going to do when this event happens? In this case, I'm going to pass an anonymous function. 
and this is fairly common. When something is clicked, run the contents of this function immediately. So for now, just to make sure it's working, we're going to console.log button was clicked. All right, let's try this out. Reload the page. I'm going to open up my console by using Shift Command C on the Mac or by going to View, Developer, Developer Tools. I'm going to switch over to the console tab and reload the page and click a button. Button was clicked. Good. So now we need to figure out how would I load a special style sheet. We now have that hook to know when we need to apply the style sheet, but how do we do that? Well, it's actually not too hard. Let's remove this code. And next I want to demonstrate what this is. And this is something that will confuse a lot of new jQuery developers. So if I console.log this, what does this refer to? It's a keyword, but what does it refer to? Well, I'll click on a button and this is what we get. It refers to the element that was clicked. When working with jQuery, we grab something, wrap it in the jQuery object, we use one of these event helpers, and then within the callback function, this will refer to the target. It will refer to the button that was clicked. So if we use a different convenience method, perhaps hover, in that case, once again, this will refer to the button that was hovered over. It's not going to refer to all of them. It's going to refer to the specific one. So for example, if I click on day, this will refer to that one. If I click on night, this will refer to the night button. But now at this point, this is not jQuery. So I can't do this.click. I can't access any of those jQuery methods because we're simply referring to a regular DOM node. If we want to gain access to jQuery's methods, we wrap it within jQuery once again. So now if I come back, reload the page, click on it, you can see that now it's wrapped in jQuery and we have access to all of the methods that we would normally have. For example, I can't do this.text changed because text is a jQuery method. If I try to do it, click on the button, we're going to get a type error. But this time, let's wrap it in jQuery. That way we actually have access to it. Reload the page, click on it, and now can you see that we have updated it. So that's an important distinction to make. Now next, I don't want to get into this too much, but you might get in the habit of doing things where you wrap it in jQuery and then you do it again, and then maybe down here you do something else, and you keep wrapping things in jQuery. And I don't want you to do this. I want you to think of the jQuery function like diving into a pool. So every time you use this jQuery function, it is diving into the pool or what would actually be the DOM and it's figuring out what you need. Now in this case, jQuery does have some optimizations, but for example, if I'm doing jQuery UL, that's going to dive into the DOM and return to me all of the unordered lists wrapped in jQuery. And then if a little later, I want to do something else with that unordered list, and then a little bit later, I want to do it again, this is what a lot of newcomers will do. They just keep referencing it. And so when you do this, you're essentially saying, hey, jQuery, jump into that pool three times. You don't want to do that. Instead, do as little amount of work as possible. So what we would do instead is we would jump into the DOM that once, and we would return the results to a variable. And we could say var uls. And then you can use that, uls.click, uls.find, list item, first child, dot text. You can use all of these methods, but now it's referring to the quote unquote cached version. This is something we often call caching. You're going to cache this query into a variable, and that way we only jump into the pool a minimum number of times. But don't worry if that's still confusing. We're going to be covering these concepts more and more. All right, let me delete all of this and let's get started. Now, when the button is clicked, we want to first just see if we can figure out how to replace the link. So we'll hard code it in for now. I'm going to grab the link element. So for now, let's be very generic and then we'll improve upon our code as we go. Get the link element, wrap it in jQuery. And now I wanna update this href or href attribute. Now we can use the adder method of the jQuery object. A-T-T-R, atter. Now that refers obviously to attribute. Now we can pass two parameters here. The first one is going to be the attribute that we want to modify, or you can pass one, in which case the value can be saved to a variable. And this is something that you can do often with jQuery. If you pass one attribute, you're returning the value. If you pass two, you're setting the value. Now in our case, we want to set the value. So link.adder, we're going to set the href attribute, and what are we going to set it to? I'm going to hard code it in for now. Night.css. 
and let's see if that worked. Reload the page, click on night, and there we go. We've now updated the style sheet. If I go into the element tab, open up head, you can see that, yep, we've done it successfully. But of course, it's not responding to the night button specifically, it's responding to any button. So if I click on day, the same thing is going to occur. So now we need a way to specify, and you could maybe have many buttons here, or you could have a list. We need a way to associate a button with the style sheet that it corresponds to. So there's a couple ways. You could use the text of the button itself. I could say var style sheet is going to be this. And remember, this will refer to the button that was clicked. And we could say text. So now if I log style sheet, reload the page, click on day, that variable is now equal to day. And then we could maybe put it to lowercase. This is a JavaScript method. One more time, click day. And now we have the lowercase representation. And then I could simply say link.addRheref is going to equal stylesheet plus dot CSS. Let's see how that works. Night, that works. Day, night, and that works. Now, is this the most ideal choice? Well, it depends. In this case, though, your text would always have to refer to the style sheet name, and that may not always be ideal. Another option you could do would be HTML5 custom attributes, and I could say data file would equal day. And then we could do the same thing down here. So as you'll learn, there's lots of different ways to, to solve a particular situation. It mostly depends on what's best for you. Now, in this case, when we're using custom attributes, we can access it a little bit differently. We can access the data attribute, and the way, if you're not familiar with these, in HTML5, you can use any number of custom attributes. I could do data Jeffrey, and that would be fine. The only requirement is it needs to be preceded with data dash, and that way the browser knows that, hey, this is a custom attribute I'm dealing with. Now, to access that value with jQuery, once again, we could simply do adder data file. That's one way we would do it. Let's view this in the browser. One more time, night, and we are getting that value. But jQuery has a better method we can use, and this is called the data method. Now, traditionally, this is used to attach specific information to an element. So I could get a UL and attach some unique bit of data. That way, in the future in my project, I can retrieve that data. But we can also use jQuery to access data attributes, and that makes sense, right? Now, the only difference is when you're using the data method, you don't do dot data data file, you cut off the prefix because it's a little bit redundant. Now let's try it, night, and once again, we're getting that value. And that's one way that we could refer to it.